Let's get right into Matthew 3. It's only 17 verses, but there we have an entire doctrine to talk about, um, which is baptism in addition to repentance uh, in this section. So I think we're just going to get uh, started right away. This, the chapter really falls into two parts, as I have on the handout. Um, the longer part is John preparing the way, and then part two is the baptism of Jesus. I look back in my notes. This is the, uh, in my ministry now, since I was a missionary in 1999, this is my, I believe, my ninth or tenth time teaching through a gospel all the way through one in Bible class, but it's my fourth time teaching Matthew. That seems to be my preferred gospel. I don't know why that is. It just happens sometimes. But I've, I, um, in the past, I saw that I attempted to teach Matthew 3 and 4 in the same day. I have no idea how I ever did that. I probably never did. Um, but that's, that's what the schedule says for those days. Let's begin. John prepares the way. I'm just going to begin. Let's, let's begin with a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us your holy word by which we are guided and informed uh, about your plan of salvation for us so that we will know our Savior, that we will give you glory, and that we will also be able to proclaim your word in the world. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So John prepares the way. Uh, I have, uh, let me read the first verse, then we'll get to John's background. So in those days, John the Baptist appeared preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying. So John is introduced the way that the Old Testament prophets are introduced. And in none of the Gospels except Luke are we told any background of John. But in Luke, we're told more background than almost anybody else has except for Jesus. So we do learn a lot of things in Luke, and here are some of them. So John's parents were, if you remember, they were both Levites, uh, they, this is Elizabeth and Zechariah. Uh, uh, Zechariah was from the 8th from the, um, division, the division of, um, of uh, oh, what is it now? Abijah. We even know where, where, when he was serving in the temple and so forth. Um, they lived in the hill country of Judea. And although we're not given their town, this would be towns like, as I have on the, on the screen, Bethel, Ramah, Hebron, Shiloh, um, there might be another like Anatoth. And these are towns that other prophets came from. So Samuel, Jeremiah, and so forth. Even I, technically Amos. So you, could, you can add on names here. These are where, these were, this is, he comes from a prophet's town, kind of, um, if you can think about that. And then he is how much older than Jesus? Six months. Six months. Yeah, we know that because Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. When she first finds out she's pregnant, Elizabeth is in her sixth month. Um, and, uh, and then uh, somehow through Mary and Elizabeth, there is a relationship. So even though Elizabeth was a Levite, there is also a family relationship to Mary and the tribe of Judah, probably because the women of various tribes married Levites and were taken into those tribes along the way. It could be some other means, but that's what I think probably happened in this case. And then John, be, this, this is the, the, one of the great dates that we have. John begins to preach according to Luke um, 3.1 in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. And we know that year. Um, Tiberius Caesar began his reign in September of 14 A.D., so the 15th year of his reign would be late in 29 or early in 30 AD. And does that meet our basic assumption about when Jesus lived and so forth? Yeah, perfectly, doesn't it? Yeah, perfectly. That Jesus was born. We talked about this last time, but I'm, the more I think about this and, uh, and sort of test the waters of biblical chronology as I've been doing the last 22 years, um, I think that uh, the, the date come up with that, 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 that was come up with by, uh, that's not a good grammar, but I'm tired. Uh, uh, the date that uh, Dionysius Exiguus came up with of 1, B, 1 AD for the birth of Christ, the more I think about it, the more I think that's pretty close to being correct. 
I don't think that um, 4 BC is, is a correct date. And I think that the chronology is incorrect that places Herod the Great dying in 4 BC. I think probably it was closer to, to 1. Because, and we, we saw that last time in some slides. Um, uh, so well, let's move on from that. Incidentally, about these Caesars, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, uh, the, the great Caesar Augustus uh, ruled a very long time. Tiberius from 14 to 37 also, you know, more than 20 years. He's really the Caesar the entire time that Jesus is around. Um, then you have a, the brief reign, mercifully brief, of Caligula, who was a maniac. Um, I think Luther calls him one of the freaks of the Roman uh, emperors. And then there's Claudius. I don't know if any of you know much about Claudius, or maybe you just know it from the PBS special I Clavdivs, which is how you spell Claudius in Latin, uh, from the 1970s. Maybe you don't remember that. Yeah, Derek Jacoby was Claudius and did it with a, a correct stutter uh, in those days. And then Nero, another one of the freaks, followed by another freaky Galba and uh, Otto. Um, Claudius is the, in the emperor in the early days of Paul and Nero in the late days of Paul. This is significant. Why? Because Paul says he will go to Caesar. Um, and so it would have been, I, I believe, Nero, Paul would have been appealing to when he went. And it would have been certainly Nero that Paul actually spoke before um, when he finally got to, to, to Caesar um, uh, in his uh, either first or second time in Rome. I don't know which one it would have been. Then, as I said, there was Otto. My grandfather's name was Othmar, named probably after this Caesar. No relation, though. Then Vitellus. Uh, finishing out the year 69, and then Vespasian, when Jerusalem was burned. Um, Vespasian was followed by the general who burned Jerusalem, whose name was Titus. Not the Titus um, Paul was writing to in the third pastoral epistle. Um, do you mind if we just go on? I, you can come back to this later, or you can Google it. It'll be quicker. Okay, yeah. So here, okay, here's one of our two big doctrines. Repent because the kingdom of heaven is near. This is the summary of John's sermon. So I don't think that John passed out bulletins, but they wouldn't have had to have printed new ones week after week. He could have had the same theme every week. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And John could have preached on any Old Testament text and come up with repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Think about that. He could have preached on Psalm 1. Blessed is the man uh, who does not sit in the seat of mockers and so forth. Repent, for the kingdom is near. Psalm 2. Kiss the son, lest he be angry with you. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven. You know, again and again and again. In fact, he could have preached on Genesis 1, verse 2. Uh, uh, let there be light. Because what did God do? He called light out of darkness, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 6. Um, so calling light out of darkness, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. So again and again and again, any passage from any prophet, most of the Psalms, even the, 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 even the, the historical books, why are some of those um, historical stories there? In the, as we, we, finished, we just studied all of Chronicles. Uh, you, you missed Chronicles by a couple of weeks if you weren't here. And uh, we were there for how long we were in Chronicles? Almost a year. Um, and uh, it was a long time. And we, we wondered, why are some of these stories in here? Well, to show where repentance should happen. Didn't always. But even wicked King Manasseh even repented. And so lessons on repentance. How many of you remember um, Dark Shadows? Yes? Dark Shadows was, a, um, what do they call it, a, uh, um, a, a soap opera in the 1960s in black and white about a vampire in the, in the American Northeast. And I forget if it was set in Maine or Massachusetts or one of those places like that, um, sort of in the exotic whaling part of the United States. And uh, I... Uh, I have a sister-in-law who was obsessed with Dark Shadows and my late wife was terrified by Dark Shadows. And um, the, the one thing about Dark Shadows 
is that I really see it as a parable about repentance. Consider this. Those of you who remember it, if you don't, then just bear with me. But in Dark Shadows, what do you have? Essentially, Barnabas Collins is the vampire, right? Who shows up after like a year of episodes, but finally he shows up. And then what does he consistently want to do? He, he, he goes and forces a, a, a doctor, I forget her name, that lady doctor, and he forces her to develop a serum that will cure him of his vampirism because he wants to get out of it. He wants to stop doing it. And then he slips and falls and he bites somebody else's neck and then he, but then he goes back to her and well, we're gonna have to change the formula. Okay, let's change. So he wants, and it's a, a, really a parable of the human side of repentance where we sin and then Christ picks us back up again and then we sin and Christ picks us back up again and again and again. And if you disagree with me about dark shadows, then fine. God bless you. It's perfectly okay. Let's move on. And I, I didn't bring any pictures. Okay. But what is repentance? Repentance consists of two parts. First, there is contrition. That is sorrow over sin. And contrition is followed by faith, which is trust in Christ for forgiveness. That's repentance. But without the faith... The contrition part of repentance is just fear, right? And without the contrition part, faith can lead to self-righteousness. That I'm, I don't need the law. I don't need Christ. And so there's a danger. That's why repentance is, is something we need to teach and teach and remember because it is, it is the work of the law and the gospel, which are the two great doctrines of Scripture. Every passage of scripture is either law or gospel or both. There is no third possibility. It's either law or gospel or both. That in some cases the law uh, reflects our sinfulness, shows our need for our savior, or simply shows the will of God. The gospel shows us the grace of God. Um, there are some places where it's difficult to tell, and, and in some cases, um, we know that uh, it, it somewhat depends on who you are reading it. Is this law or is this gospel? Um, but, uh, and in some cases, it's both because God sends it both ways, but law or gospel. Um, let's go to another part of his, of his message, unless we have a question there. Good, because we have a lot about baptism to get to, so let's move on. Um, although I'm certainly willing to talk about repentance. But then uh, uh, Matthew continues, yes, this is he of whom this was spoken through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Um, so uh, uh, our, our, this is Isaiah and, and, and John both talking here. Um, are they talking about actual roads? When they say, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path a road straight. No. What, what road is this? Where is it? Our stubborn, heart. It's, it's, my, it's my heart, isn't it? Yeah. So what is it in me that's preventing the gospel from coming? Or, and, and, or, or from the law from working? Whichever it is, I got to get out there like, like, a, like a convict on a chain gang and smash them rocks. Or, or clear them out of the way so the law and gospel can work. Um, what, another way Jesus put it was in the parable of the sower. What kind of soil do I have? What are the four soils? Remember in the parable of the sower? There is the, 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 the rocky soil. These aren't necessarily in order. But then there's also the soil that's um, uh, 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 it's on the path. So it gets walked on. And the third one? Weedy soil, yeah. So some gets choked by weeds, some gets burned by the sun, or, or else the plant shoots up but it can't send its roots down. And then the fourth kind of soil is the good soil. And the sower in, in, in ancient times did not poke holes in the ground and put the seeds in the holes. He just 
sowed. He just threw it. And that's why in the, in the is it Martin Franzman? The sower sows his reckless love. I think that's a Martin Franzman hymn, but uh, I love that hymn. It's, it's a great, great hymn with, with lots of, of uh, delightful pictures all taken from the parable. Okay, make his path straight. Now to John. John, I'm sorry, I'm not really following the sheet. I'm just following the screen right now, but I'll get, I'll get to it on the second page. <coughs> John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. Camel's hair has two sides, right? It has the burlap side. And what's the other one? I'll just call it, Beth? Well, that, that's the burlap side, the coarse hair side. The other side is just more like, more like, uh, uh, any of you ever worn anything that was buckskin? If you, if you cure it properly and, and candle it, it's actually quite soft. Um, uh, and uh, uh, my mom made a, uh, uh, I forget if it was a vest or a short like a short outdoor shirt I used to wear on my bare skin as a boy. It was buckskin. It was really wonderful. It was delightful uh, to wear. Um, the problem is boys get everything dirty and tear everything and make it all smelly and cruddy and, but <coughs> and they grow. Um, so, but uh, it was delightful. Camel hair can be like that. So John isn't necessarily wearing camel's hair so that he will repent. What's, why is he wearing camel's hair? Because it has one more quality. It's durable. He doesn't have to replace it. So he, once it's on, it's kind of like, it, we would say denim. You know, it's going to last if it's good denim. And if it's good camel hair, it's going to last a long time. He also wore a leather belt around his waist. This wasn't a cheap belt. This was leather. It was going to last also. And, and bind things. And his food, locusts and wild honey. Any of you ever eaten a bug? <laughs> oh, I have. You can, there, there are some times where, uh, where uh, 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 a cooked insect is uh, actually just, you know, um, crunchy, but there's protein there. And it depends on the sauce you put it in. Um, I would rather have a locust or a grasshopper, probably in my own opinion, than, uh, than certain seafoods. Um, I'm a fan of many seafoods, but not all of them. Um, also, uh, there is in, the, in Leviticus, with regard to clean and unclean food, a lot of the seafoods I'm leery of were on the unclean list, but locusts, uh, Leviticus 12, 11, are among the clean animals. So you may eat any kind of locust, katydid, cricket, or grasshopper. What's the difference between a locust and a grasshopper? The weather in March. I mean that. Locusts are not a separate breed of insect. Uh, locusts are grasshoppers. The only thing that happens is if in the early spring... There's a certain weather condition, that weather pattern that can happen that will change the chemical balance of a grasshopper's mind. Normally, grasshoppers are solitary animals. But if they have, I think it's a hot, wet spring, they will become gregarious and they will flock. They will begin to swarm and they become locusts. Otherwise, there's no difference physically. They just, they just had a hot, wet spring. And so what happened here in New Ulm? in the 1870s. Anybody know? A swarm of locusts came that lasted for four years. Um, and it wasn't just New Ulm. It actually, I, I, I act like it was just local, but it was, it started I think in St. Louis and it went to um, Missoula. So from Montana to um, Missouri. That's how big this locust plague was. Four years. I think it was 1873 to 77. And I've said this before. You don't see cowboy in Indian movies that talk about this part of the U.S. in those years, do you? 
They don't. I wonder what they would do with CGI technology and the locust swarms, or if there would be any shootouts during the locust plagues. Because the problem is, you'd reach for your gun and the stupid insects would have eaten away the holster. You know, it would be fall on the ground before you could reach for your six shooter. So, uh, they, because they actually ate the suspenders off of farmers' bodies as they stood there, you know, harnessing, and they, they, they ate the harness off the horses. They devoured everything. And then in the fall, they would burrow under the ground and lay their eggs. And then in the spring, they would come back. And that's what happened. And finally, there was a spring, I think it was 1877, where this, or maybe it was 78, where the winter was cold enough that uh, the, 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 the locust, the grasshopper eggs di mostly died in the, in the freeze. And so they didn't come back again. But little boys in this area, I know, were getting a dollar a week, uh, I'm sorry, a penny a wheelbarrow. And some of them made several dollars just shoveling wheelbarrows full of these li mostly living grasshoppers and taking them to the, they, were, they just had burning piles. You know, in New Ulm, in Mankato, in, uh, in Nicolet, I'm not sure what other cities were around in those days. Well, Laura Ingalls Wilder talks about Walnut Grove, right? And another town, was it uh, maybe, oh, Sleepy Eye certainly was around in the, in the 70s. Um, but in, so Laura, I'm not sure if she even talks about the, the grasshoppers or if she's too late. She too late or does she talk about it? Do they? Okay. All right. Well, let's move on. So John has clothes like an Old Testament prophet. Zechariah had a pro talks about a prophet's garment of hair, a, something durable. And why did John wear the garment of hair? Um, and I, I, uh, I had a note on that. What did I? What did, oh, I, 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 to uh, as a as a testimony against self righteousness. Yeah, and then his diet set him apart. You know, locusts was was honey acceptable? In the oh sure, who famously ate honey in the Old Testament? Do you remember? Jonathan. Jonathan and Samson. Yeah, both of them. Yeah, in both of their cases, isn't the honey in a dead animal carcass? Yeah, um, so also you have Ezekiel, eat this scroll I'm giving you and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. So natural sweetener. Do you know that honey doesn't spoil? Some, they, they found honey in a pharaoh's tomb. And I don't know, I wouldn't want to be the, 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 the guy to test it. Is it still good? It's only, it's only 3,000 years old. You know, I, no, Dave can test that. I don't, I don't have to test that. Yeah, I guess if you warm it up, right? Also, his message is very like the Old Testament prophets. There are some other comparisons. Let's move on. And then Jerusalem and all of Judea and all the region around the Jordan were going out to him. So people heard about him. How long it had, had it been since they had heard a prophet? 400 years. Malachi um, is around, around, around 380 BC. It's been 400 years since they've heard a prophet. And so a prophet comes and they want to go. Um, when I lived in Watertown, Wisconsin, um, uh, and, the, and the state fair or the, or the, the, the county fair came, uh, people would ask, did you go hear Chicago? You know, because the, the band Chicago played and we're just playing live and, and you know, it was like, and I, I didn't have to. I didn't have to go. I just had to open my window, you know. And, uh, um, uh, but uh, things like that. Did you go see? Have you heard? Um, and it was, the, it was the thing to do, um, to go. Um, who is it that my son wants to go and see at, uh, there's, is there a winery? There is, between here and Mankato, if you're on 68. And what's the guy's name? No, I'm thinking of the guy who was in the Mamas and the Papas. Um, who is it? Is it, is it, um, is it McGuinn or McGuire? Roger McGuire is, lives there and plays. So it's the, I think it's the McGuire Jazz Trio. Um, so, and we, you know, we drive past the sign all the time 
And like, oh, maybe we should go, see, you know, because one of these summers he's not going to be there anymore and he'll have moved on or he'll have figured out Minnesota winters or something. So, but Everybody goes out to see him. Everybody wants to see John. And so they were all, or they were baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. So we have, along with uh, baptism, you have confession and what are, what are the two parts of contrition? Or, or of repentance, rather. It's confession, that is contrition, and then faith. And baptism brings faith. You've been listening to Invisible Church, the Bible study podcast from St. Paul's Lutheran Church, New Wall, Minnesota.